first of all, uh, thank you very much for the very kind introduction, and also I'd like to thank Professor Rafiq Ghani for inviting me to give the inaugural lecture of uh, CAPE uh, process here at the uh, Technical University of uh, Denmark. And, uh, and again, it's truly an honor to be here. Uh, one of the things, though, before I start my talk, uh, I should notice the fact that I'm sure you may have also noticed that today is, in fact, September 11. That, unfortunately, also sort of brings back sad uh, memories of the very horrific events that happened 13 years ago. I think the only thing I can say, I really hope that we all remember the victims and that we always will keep them in our minds. Now, despite the sad anniversary, I hope this should still be a happy event because life has to go on. And I think in that spirit, what I'd like to do today is to share with you some of our thoughts in terms of what should be the role of process systems engineering in uh, chemical engineering. Now, so the major questions that I'd like to address in the presentation are the following. The first one, what are some of the major trends, especially recent trends that have happened in chemical engineering, and how have they related to process systems engineering? The second question I'd like to address is what's been the impact of process systems engineering, and in particular, how it relates again to chemical engineering. And one of the aspects that I'd also like to address is the question, what are the intellectual research challenges in the area, which often maybe are not always appreciated. Now, in the spirit, again, of trying to introduce what do we mean by process systems engineering, I think it's useful to review, if you wish, the definition that basically states that process systems engineering is concerned with systematic analysis and optimization of decision-making processes for what? For the discovery, design, manufacture, and distribution of chemical products. So here, what I'd like to emphasize is, first of all, the fact that process systems engineering is about systematic analysis and optimization. So we're talking mostly about methodologies, that's the first thing. But the important thing is that these methodologies are in order to support decision-making processes. And I think that's what makes it different very often from, uh, for example, some of the other branches, say, in uh, chemical engineering. So having said that, what are some of the trends that have happened in chemical engineering in the last decade? Well, I think without doubt, one of the major developments has been the emergence of the area of bioengineering. And uh, this has been, certainly at least in the States, and I think also in a good part of the world, been regarded, if you wish, as a court hot area, for example, at least in the States, a very large number of new professors, new faculty members have been hired into this area. Now, why has this happened? Well, it has happened because to a large extent it's opened new frontiers that did not exist before in chemical engineering. And here, one example that I'd like to quote is a work by Bob Langer at MIT where he studied and developed polymers to deliver drugs, particularly genetically engineered <laughs> proteins. So we're talking about drug delivery. And the question here is, of course, say 30 years ago, for example, in chemical engineering, nobody maybe would have dreamt about you know, this being as part of chemical engineering. So I think that's been a very exciting and uh, important development. Now, the other development that has taken place over the last decade, at least certainly in the case of the United States, is that many new biomedical engineering departments were formed. Reason for that was funding from the Whitaker Foundation. And this despite the fact that there were maybe some questions as to whether there was in fact a job market for biomedical engineers. But many chemical engineering departments reacting on the one hand on the idea that bioengineering does represent, of course, a new frontier. And at the same time, seeing maybe some of these new biomedical engineering departments as competition basically decided to rename themselves either as chemical and biomolecular or chemical and biological engineering. And, and again, this has happened really not only in the US, even here, I noticed that you're chemical and biochemical engineering, a little different than what we have here. But the other uh, important development that has taken place in the last decade is, of course, the emergence and application of nanotechnology in chemical engineering. It has really come from other areas, like, for example, from chemistry and physics, but, you know, which again has impacted chemical engineering. Now, what's been the uh, effect of that? Well, on the one hand, of course, you know, we've opened new frontiers, but at the same time, it also means that there's been an increasing emphasis on basic science in chemical engineering. In fact, if you go to many departments of chemical engineering, 
uh, certainly in the U.S. and I think also in other parts of the world, you'll see that many of them are actually not chemically injured by training. Now, this is not necessarily anything wrong because, in fact, if you look at the past, for example, in the University of Minnesota, Wisconsin, we had some very good examples of, you know, uh, uh, faculty who were not chemically engineers and who ended up making really important contributions. But one effect that it has had is, without question, the fact that it's increased the multidisciplinary approach. So I think more and more, we don't think ourselves necessarily just as chemical engineers, but I think the scope has obviously broadened. At the same time, in terms of the education, there's no question that there's been a decreased emphasis on fundamentals, at least in terms of teaching of chemical engineering. For example, there's now fewer transport courses. In many cases, you have maybe two fluids and heat and mass transfer. In some cases, just one transport course. In many cases, thermodynamics has been reduced to a single semester where you teach first, second law, and phase and chemical equilibria. In the case of process systems engineering courses, the effect has even been greater in the sense uh, many uh, universities, at least in the States, have the process design course being taught by, the, by an adjunct faculty member, often a retired engineer from industry. In fact, the course of process control at many universities is no longer required. So in that sense, we see there's been sort of a shift uh, or an impact, obviously, in terms of the education. Now, the other thing that is uh, very clear, why is this happening to some extent? Well, clearly, because again, the frontiers are expanding. Many of the new professors in chemical engineering no longer publish in chemical engineering journals. Why is that? Because there's been, again, the move from engineering towards science. So, for example, here we can see the traditional journals like AICHE Journal, INEC, Chemical Engineering Science, you have these days relatively small percentage. INEC say 15% of the papers come from the US. AICHE has increased it recently, but it's also close to 15. It's now close to 25%. And why is that? Well, because of course, for many new faculty, the aspiration is to publish in journals like Science and Nature. Again, why is that? Well, for a simple reason, impact factor is much greater. And in fact, of course, if you can get a paper published in Science and Nature, that's by mo all means a very good thing. The problem is when you start not publishing anymore in mainstream journals of chemical engineering, because then we have to ask ourselves the question, is this sustainable for the future of the profession of uh, chemical engineering? Now, if we now look at the connection with industry, let's not forget about the fact that if you look at the companies that you know, hire mostly chemical engineers, you have sort of the petroleum companies, the chemical companies, consumer products, pharmaceuticals. And then, of course, we have, do have the new emerging biotech firms like Amgen and Genentech. But the fact is, if you look just at the volume of the revenues, the fact is that the petroleum chemical industry is still very dominant in our profession. It's definitely something that we need to be aware that we still need to connect with that sector, if you wish, of the industry. And again, despite the fact that there's been obviously some very impressive uh, growth in terms of the biotech uh, firms. But talking about the relationship with the industry, it turns out there was a very interesting session at the last AICHE meeting organized by the late uh, uh, John Chen, where essentially what they did, they polled the industry. Here you can see uh, there were 93 respondents from various manufacturing, R&D, and engineering companies about the importance of various subjects. And the three top subjects that were identified, UO was unit operations, transport phenomena, thermodynamic separations, that was rated on a scale one to five as 4.6, was rated the highest. The second one was reaction engineering at 4.0, analysis, modeling, and simulation was also 4.0. So obviously these were rated as the higher ones. And interestingly enough, the emerging areas like biotechnology and nanotechnology, one was rated 2.5, was rated 1.8. So clearly what we're facing here, at least right now momentarily, is some disconnect, I would say, between academia and industry. In fact, the other uh, measure of this is, of course, if you look at the trends in faculty composition. So here, if you look on the one hand, for example, at faculty who can claim to do work that was related to unit operations, thermal operations, and so forth, you can see that, for example, at the level of assistant professors, just barely about 5%. So it's decreased enormously from what it used to be, like emeritus professors were talking about more than 30 years ago. Now, what happens with the bio area, for example, is just the opposite. You can see that the new young professors are even 
people are approaching close to 40% of the composition of the faculty. So, so one of the things that we have to be aware of is that this, this, this sort of dynamic changes that are taking place that should, in principle, uh, raise, if you wish, a red flag. And in fact, one of the manifestations, if you wish, of that concern about maybe a possible disconnect between academia and industry has been Dow Chemical, where one of the things that we're worried about was hiring PhDs, especially that would be proficient in reaction engineering, separations, and thermodynamics, and modeling systems. So uh, one of the things that Dow Chemical has done is to commit uh, for 10 years, $25 million per year in the US, $10 million per year outside the US, in order to promote research in what they regard as being problems that are relevant to the chemical industry. So again, we're facing now a, a little bit this uh, disconnect. On the other hand, of course, you know, things do change, and they have changed, of course, recently. So the emphasis that we saw on bio, on nano, that has been true, but if you look at more recently, obviously, there's been now a new emphasis on energy and sustainability. And the reason for that is very simple. In the case of energy, it is expected that maybe over the next 25 years, there'd be something like a 70% increase in the demand of energy. How you supply that energy is a major challenge. At the same time, we're also facing the issue that the emissions of CO2 are increasing to levels that we have not seen before. There's possible implications, of course, of climate change. So how to address these problems? And these problems, in principle, of course, do belong, they should belong very much to chemical engineering. So what becomes, I think, clear is that both energy and sustainability will be probably emerging as new major trends that may swing the pendulum somewhat away from bio and nano. doesn't mean that bio and nano will not remain important. They will remain important. They should be important, but they not be necessarily the only, if you wish, dominant force within chemical engineering. So, what about process systems engineering? Well, what's the situation that's happened here? So what's interesting, if you look back again, maybe over the last uh, 10 years, one of the things that has happened is it's greatly expanded its scope. It's expanded the scope in the sense, if you look at this diagram, we're here, you have length scale going from picometers to kilometers, from picoseconds to months and maybe years. The main point here is that traditional process systems engineering has concentrated here you see we're going from molecular to particles to processes, plants, all the way to enterprise level. But traditionally, the emphasis on process systems engineering has been here in the middle, looking at process units and looking at plants. But if you look at the good part of the work that has taken place over the last decade, there's been an increasing emphasis to work at the molecular level. So that's on the one dimension. The other one is towards, if you wish, the enterprise level, not only looking at a single plant, but at a collection of plants, looking basically at, uh, at networks. And we could even argue that there's also some work that's even starting to worry about the global level in terms of climate change and, and so forth in the context of process systems engineering. Now, the question is, of course, you ask, well, how is it possible that process systems engineering can, you know, or be able to address problems of such varied nature. I think the important point here I want to make is that when we talk about process systems engineering, there is a science base. A science base in the sense there is uh, some basic knowledge on which we're relying. So for example, if we do process integration and conceptual design, we rely on basic process knowledge from chemical engineering, basic fundamentals. If we worry about, for example, predicting performance of processes and products, we require simulation, which in turn then requires knowledge in numerical analysis. If you want to do synthesis and design in which you perform optimization, you do need to know about mathematical programming. If you do manufacturing, process control is uh, essential. And for that, again, knowledge of systems and control theory, which is, again, wide body of knowledge becomes quite essential. And also, when you go into computing, the relation with computer science, or even when you look at problems in supply chain, where you worry about operations and business, you even also have to rely on some concepts of management science. So the basic point here, the basic message is that when we talk about process systems engineering, it's not really necessarily a very narrow field, but it's really drawing you know, on a very large body of knowledge, as I have listed it here. Now, just as an example, and this is in the case of mathematical programming, because that happens to be, if you wish, my favorite subject. It's basically a lot of the, our research work that we've been working on. What does it deal with? Well, we worry, for example, about how to solve mixed integer nonlinear programming problems where you have continuous discrete variables. So we do worry also about sort of the math 
aspect of that problem, and also the particular cases, whether it be mixed integer linear, linear programming, or nonlinear programming. The main point here is, again, that in order to be able to, uh, for process uh, systems engineer to be able to address these problems, we need a whole set of machinery, one of which is, in this case, mathematical programming, as I've illustrated here. Now, so then, having then seen what's been some of the trends, the question is, what are then really the challenges that we're facing in this area? Well, I think we can classify them, and this is, of course, somewhat arbitrary, but nevertheless, uh, three major areas we can identify. One is product and process design, especially greater emphasis on product design, which I know especially is greatly emphasized uh, here at uh, CAPEC. The second one is energy and sustainability, because we've seen that's obviously emerging as one of the new needs. And the third one is enterprise product optimization, which again, I would say is a relatively recent trend that in many ways has been foreign you know, to many chemical engineers. So let me start very briefly then with product and process design. So here, one of the interesting ideas, this is actually from a slide stole from George Stephanopoulos, the idea that some of the concepts that we learn about batch and continuous processes, some of those concepts can be applied, for example, to microsystems, when you have the concept, if you wish, of a plant of a chip, you still have the concept of the flow sheet, you still have the concept of interactions, the control, and so forth. And even when you go to the molecular level, for example, at the level of the cell, a lot of the processes are taking place here to mimic, in a way, at the end, you know, the behavior of a flow sheet. So, uh, first of all, so again, just to realize that the concepts that we've had here can be applied here down to the lower scales. Now, one good example of molecular level type of uh, uh, work in the area of optimization is this work by Chris Flutas at Princeton, who basically it deals with the novel protein design. And the idea here is you define a target template where you have uh, these uh, coordinates for things like nitrogen, calcium, carbon, and oxygen. And the idea then here is once you define that template, you want to find a protein that falls into that template with a state of minimum energy. So the interesting thing here is that some of the tools that have been used quite extensively in process systems engineering have been applied to that problem. So for example, the in silico sequence selection here for the target template can be actually formulated as a mixed integer linear programming problem. The fold specificity, where you minimize the energy for folding, is actually a global optimization problem. An important point here is this has been not only an academic ex exercise, but for example, result of this work actually led to the discovery of some new improved inhibitors, actually in collaboration with some, with some people in the medical field. So this clearly shows, you know, for example, how, for example, PSE has greatly expanded in terms of scope. This is actually some work that I did with my colleague, Mike Domac, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, looking at metabolic networks. And we're here again, it's an illustration on how we can use some of the tools of PSE. Basically, the idea here, say you have this uh, uh, metabolic network and you want to find the reaction uh, pathway that minimizes the deviation from spectra that are obtained from NMR measurements. So it turns out here, first of all, how do you find all possible pathways? Well, it turns out that that's basically finding all the extreme points of a mixed integer linear program that is defined by the flux analysis of this network. How you find the uh, particular pathway that minimizes the deviation from experimental measurements it turns out to be, again, here, a global optimization problem for an inverse problem. So again, we're seeing that uh, kind of, kind of very different different type of application in which we're using these type of tools. The next sample I want to give here is again due to Professor Rafik Ghani in the area of computer-aided molecular design. It's actually a slide of a talk that he gave at Carnegie Mellon, the Bayer Lecture. And again here, the idea is that rather than sort of uh, using intuition or just rules of thumb on how you select solvents, you can actually systematically first pose high-level type of questions, then do find the basic building blocks that give rise to these possible solvents, then you know, collect the uh, basic information in order to generate the various alternatives and in that way perform the screening and propose you know, for a given need what are possible solvents that may fulfill that requirement. So again, here we're seeing a systematic way of a process that is applied at the molecular level. Now, another example I wanted to mention here, this is work by Venkat, at, uh, when he was still at Purdue, and it's the idea of multi-scale uh, design and analysis. So here, the idea is to have an integrated design environment for 
formulated rubber plants. This was actually a project for Caterpillar. And you see the interesting thing here is that you go all the way from quantum mechanics to predict the kinetics of the reactions. The kinetics of the reaction then take you to the next level where you do analysis of heat transfer with uh, doing a finite element analysis. You look at the constitutive models for looking also at the mechanics. And then finally, you have the design of the part. So again, here we're integrating a whole set of different levels. And again, this can be accomplished with some of the tools that have been developed in process systems engineering. Now, I don't want to give the impression everything is molecular. One of the reasons I wanted to bring up this slide is because I really think one of the major challenges, and I know this is a challenge that is also being addressed here at the center, is a one of process intensification. The idea here, this is a very nice example of work by Jeff Sirola that they had at Eastman Chemical where they had for methyl acetate one reaction and then seven distillation columns, a rather complex flow sheet. And the thing that was really quite remarkable was the idea of saying, well, this pro complex process flow sheet can actually be replaced by one single reactive distillation column in which all the various tasks that are taking place in these columns and the reaction can be integrated into a single column. Needless to say, that had a tremendous impact in terms of reducing the investment costs, in terms of reducing the operating costs. Now, the big question is, how do you discover systematically this? I think, to my knowledge, is still an open question. But hopefully, we'll see you know, some of the answers to that type of problem in the near future. So that's the first part I wanted to talk about. So now let's talk about energy and sustainability. So here, one of the things that has been, of course, of great concern, as we mentioned before, is the carbon footprint of the various energy options. We know that, for example, when you look at coal, coal is maybe one of the most uh, offending type of components in terms of the emissions of CO2. Now, with natural gas, you know, we're able to reduce greatly the emissions of CO2 about by one half, but these are still fairly significant emissions. So we have as options maybe biomass, photovoltaics, even nuclear, wind and hydro powers as alternatives. And one of the challenges in here is to say, well, how can we make some of these alternative technologies competitive with the ones that rely on fossil fuels, whether it be coal or natural gas. So that, that's a big uh, question or challenge that we're facing here. Now, why is this a non-trivial problem? Well, there has been the perception we're running out of oil, and that uh, there was even a term called the peak. If we reach the peak, we're supposed to be, I think, sometime in the early 2000s. Well, uh, the news, it's not happened. If you look at the oil reserves in the year 2000, in the year 2010, here we had 1,105, here 1,383. So that means there's been a 25, 25 percent increase in reserves of oil over a 10-year span. So it means we're not running out of oil. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means, among other things, the competition for renewables is going to get much stiffer because now all of a sudden, you know, we do have, you know, still plenty of uh, oil or crude oil available. Furthermore, this has been also amplified by the fact that when, again, we think about depletion of fossil fuels, what's happened? Well, the emergence of shale gas, at least certainly in the States, has you know, taken tremendous uh, you know, growth. Uh, as you probably know, in the case of shale gas, you uh, do the drilling, lateral drilling here, then you do hydraulic fracturing in order to release the gas that is trapped here in the, low, in, the, in, the, in the proper shale. And the main point here, for example, if you look at the United States, the prediction is that by 2035, half of the gas will come from shale gas. And for example, the one part of the United States where it's going to see uh, great growth is the Northeast, because that's, for example, we have the Marcellus shale gas, where it's being predicted the production of a 20-fold increase in production of the shale gas. So they, this is now really starting to change really tremendously the picture. In fact, many people use the term a game changer. It has been truly been a game changer in the sense of changing the energy picture and the fact also that shale gas contains hydrocarbons. It's wet gas, so you can also use that for feeding your uh, chemical industry. Now, but in addition to the energy, there's also, when we think about sustainability, the problem of water. Water is actually an area, I don't know how it is, for example, here in Denmark, uh, but for example, in the United States, and I know in some other countries, unfortunately, in my opinion, they've sort of given away water to the civil engineers, when in fact, a lot of the problems of water do require knowledge of chemical engineering. But the main motivation here is if you look at this map, you can see the areas in orange. That's, uh, these are areas where scarcity of water has already been reached. That's the case, for example, 
south west of the United States. Here in Europe, you're still in fairly good shape, but of course, north of Africa, part of Asia here is in trouble. But the main point here, it is predicted that by the year 2025, two thirds of the world population will face water stress. So conserving water somehow will become increasingly a very important problem. So how do we address this issue? Well, it turns out in the context of process engineering, what we can do, and this is one example of a case where we use, for example, mathematical programming in order to address this problem. Here we have a superstructure with the main idea is to reuse and recycle water. So you get the fresh water coming in here. You have the process units. You have your treatment units. You may have some sinks where water is lost, like cooling towers. You may have source of water, for example, where you separate the water. If you consider all possible combinations, how you interconnect this, then you can pose an optimization problem. I'm showing it here just in words, where you minimize the cost or minimize fresh water consumption. You have a set of constraints, which in this case, when you do the mass balances with flow and concentrations, you get bilinear equations, and you get what is called a non-convex problem, meaning you can get trapped in local solutions. So here, an interesting question has also been to say, well, even when we develop a relatively simplified model, how do we find the global optimum? And the point, again, I'm not going to go into the details on how you do that, but maybe just illustrate with an example. In this case, we have one feed, five process units, and three contaminants for which we use three treatment units. And this would be the entire superstructure where we account for all the possibilities. What we want to do is automatically extract that network structure that will hopefully minimize, in particular, the consumption of the fresh water. What we obtain here, solving the problem to global optimality within a 1% of uh, tolerance, you, you can see it's in about three minutes of computation, this is the structure that we obtain. This is not an obvious structure, it's not something that one could intuitively derive, because for one thing you can notice here, fresh water is only being used for the first process unit. The second, third, fourth, and fifth are using water that's being reused or recycled. That has the effect that although, of course, we have you know, some complex structure here, the fact is that the consumption that is being predicted here is almost an order of magnitude lower than if we did not do any reuse or recycle. If we just simply went straight through and used fresh water into each one of these process units, we would require 300 tons per hour. So clearly, this shows that you know, optimization of a problem like this one in the context also of water has great importance. Now, why is that important? Well, if we think again about renewables, biofuels is obviously an important area. So here, one of the questions is, given the fact that we know that these processes can be energy intensive and they can also consume a large amount of water, how do we address those problems? So here, what we have done is develop like a strategy where for the energy optimization, one of the things that we do is given the fact that you have reactions like fermentations that take place at relatively modest temperatures, we use in this case multi-effect distillation in order, if you wish to alter the composite curves in order to enhance the heat integration. Because you see, in the case of petrochemicals, you usually have a source of heat at a high temperature, and that's what allows the heat integration. But that's not the case when you have, for example, fermentation in a biomass process. In the case of water optimization, we can apply the technique I just presented before. The issue is that the cost of water is still very small. At least in the United States, for example, contribution to the objective function would be less than 0.1%. So what can we do about it? Well, I think if we're responsible, we can say, well, we do our energy optimization, and then we impose as a constraint that we will come up with a network where we minimize the fresh water consumption, because if you wish, it's the right thing to do, if you wish. And, and that's something we can uh, do with this type of strategy. So, so what's the scope of this type of approach? Well, let me give you the following e example. These are corn-based uh, processes for producing bioethanol. And over the years, these are values that have been reported for energy consumption. Started from 75,000 BTUs per gallon. The more recent one was 38,323. Now, what was the outcome here? Well, it turns out applying the methodology that I just outlined before, in our group, we're able to show that this 38,000 could, in fact, be reduced to close to 25,000 BTU per gallon. So, in other words, there's still scope for reducing the energy consumption. And it was largely due to the use of multi-effect distillation combined with heat integration. The, what about water? Water, it turns out, the initial corn-based ethanol plants use a very large amount of water, almost 11 gallons 
per gallon of ethanol. That's been decreasing now to a level of 3.4. And here again, the question, can we do better? Well, here again, if we use an approach like the one that I allowed them before, you can actually show that this 3.4 can, in fact, be reduced to 1.5. And why is that? Because by performing better integration, reusing, recycling the water, that's one way you can actually reduce the consumption. So I think the, the other nice or I find sort of exciting thing about uh, process systems engineering, it gives us also some targets at which we can basically aim at making our processes more efficient and more economic. Now, let me uh, give you an illustration of a case of the thermochemical bioethanol, because uh, obviously corn-based ethanol is something that in general you don't want. This is first generation, so we're interested more looking at second generation. This is one example. We're looking at ethanol via gasification. And here, uh, uh, just to walk you very briefly, we're looking at alternatives of doing direct versus indirect. That's high pressure, low pressure, doing steam reforming, doing partial oxidation. We clean up, we remove here the particles. And a key step here is the ratio of CO to hydrogen that you can adjust with a water gas shift reaction or you can do with pressure swing adsorption in order to separate some of the excess hydrogen. Then you go here to the removal of sour gases, CO2, H2S. You can use MEA, pressure swing adsorption, or membrane. Different configuration, that's a sub superstructure here. And once you obtain the thin gas at the side composition, you could do the route of fermentation or you could do the route of catalytic reaction. In the case of fermentation, there's actually different options on how you do the final separation to get the fuel grade uh, ethanol. In this in the catalytic case, we do basically only distillation. So here again, given then the superstructure, we can put together a model and the model predicted the structure that is shown here where you can see what was selected was the direct classification at the high pressure steam reforming, and what was interesting here was the use of pressure swing adsorption to separate the hydrogen. Because one important effect, as we'll see in a moment, this is shown here, when you look at the production cost of the ethanol, by the credit that you can get from separating the hydrogen, you can actually reduce by almost one half the production cost, because the cost of price of hydrogen is actually very high. So, so one of the intriguing things here, when you look at this structure, and here, by the way, what the uh, optimization did was to select, as you can see, the catalytic route, okay, and that's what gave rise to this annualized cost and this production cost. But the interesting thing here is also when you look at the energy consumption, energy consumption here is much less than what you have in core-based ethanol, so in that sense you're in, in that sense in better shape, although in the case of water consumption that may actually be greater, as we'll see in a moment. But basically, the idea then here, this just comes to illustrate that from many possible alternatives through a superstructure, we can systematically try to identify those which, you know, will tend to be the more promising alternatives. And this type of analysis can be done in the context of building up a refinery, just like the analysis that I did for that particular classification process can be embedded in uh, here alternatives where you're using at uh, grains, at lignin cellulose, at uh, algae, and different alternatives also for producing different products. And again, I know this is an active area of research here in the uh, center, but again, I just mentioned it because it also represents one of the important frontiers in process systems engineering. But on the other hand, we still have to worry about fossil fuels. And one of the interesting problems here uh, is the one it's a collaboration we've had with ExxonMobil, is the idea of optimal development of oil fields. So the question here, you have an offshore location, and the dots here represent potential wells where you can drill. And the main point here is the facilities that you require here are typically multi-billion dollar type of investments. Here, the most recent trend, instead of using just uh, plain uh, sort of uh, platforms, is to use what are called floating production storage offloading. It's basically like a big ship from which you can do the so-called subsea wells. So you have greater flexibility for drilling the wells. And not only that, within the ship, you can perform separation of the crude oil from gas and water. So it's almost like a small processing plant itself. And then, of course, that's connected to the uh, sea here. The main point here is, again, you have decisions like deciding you know, how many of these facilities you're going to build, what's going to be the number of wells that you're going to drill, and what's the profile of production, because we don't know that profile ahead of time. We do have some information from reservoir simulation. And basically, the idea then here is to determine these decisions to maximize the net present value. So it turns out, again, this can be formulated as a mixed nonlinear model. 
The nonlinearity comes from the fact that from the reservoir model, we are just nonlinear curves that mimic basically the production that we're going to have in each one of these wells. And this has been applied, for example, in this case where we have a 20-year time horizon. We're looking at 10 fields and the possibility of having up to three FPSOs. So this is actually, you can see, the optimal solution that we obtain where you, we have the assignments of the various FPSOs to various fields where we're basically drilling up to 23 wells, and this is done over a period of time. This would be actually the production profile that comes from each one of the three FPSOs because, of course, they're connected to the different wells. The main point here is that this makes a nonlinear problem, you know, which has uh, of the order of 5,000 uh, uh, continuous variables, 10,000 constraints, 501 variables can be solved in about one minute. So again, this shows again how some of the tools that have been developed do have a bearing, do have application in these type of problems. Now, but talking about uh, fossil fuels, of course, another in interesting area that we can think of is shale gas. So what are the type of tools that are possible to develop when you want to exploit shale gas? And here I'm just showing the relative uh, reserves that are uh, at the moment uh, assessed in the case of China being number one, U.S. being number two, Argentina three, Mexico four, and Canada number five. And there's, of course, other uh, major countries that also have potential here. So, so what can you do with this type of uh, uh, problem? Well, in some respect, the type of problem I presented before with the offshore grill we've uh, developed here a model to predict the optimal drilling strategy, both the infrastructure, but one strategy that will actually tell you over time, here we have a total of nine different well paths on which you can do the drilling. You can drill up to three wells for each one of these well paths. And you can see here, in some cases, this decreases because there may be shortage of water. And these are the production profiles over time. So to some extent, some of the tools that have been applied, for example, to upstream petroleum could obviously have a bearing in the case of the shale gas production. But related to shale gas and talking again, issues related to sustainability, we do have to worry about water. And water here is a very important issue because you see here again we have the diagram of the uh, fracturing. So essentially what happens here is first of all in each one of these wells you drill not one but in fact multiple wells, sometimes as many as 20 different wells. And the issue with water that is very interesting in this problem and is very unique is the fact that you need water for only a very short period of time but you need a very large amount of water. Something of the order of three to five million gallons over only a three-month uh, period because basically what you do, this is the so-called completion stage in which basically you're performing the, uh, the fracturing. So here, it also is a form of comparison. If you think, well, are we not, maybe not using too much water in the case of shale gas compared, say, to coal, it is still much less when you integrate it over, say, 20 or 40 years. But the, the question, however, is what are the logistics that it takes to provide this water for this very short period of time. So here, basically, one of this thematic sort of shows, you know, what is uh, logistics that is involved. So typically, you have like a large river where you have a truck that is being loaded in order to take some of that water to the corresponding well pad that's then used for the hydraulic fracturing. Then some of that water returns, that's the so-called flowback water. So that water is sent to a wastewater treatment facility and that water can then be returned, for example, to be reused, for example, to drill another well. Or in fact, you can also think, although this is a less desirable alternative, to take some of the water to wastewater disposal. Okay? So, so the question then here is again, how do we provide for that water? Well, interestingly enough, this problem turns out to be essentially a scheduling problem. So in the area of batch scheduling, one very important uh, uh, work has been the one on the state has network uh, by Condilio Pantelis and Sargent. And the concepts developed there can actually be applied to that problem. You think of states like, for example, the source of the river, we call that the robust source, some small sources of water. These are creeks that are feeding into impoundments and basically the yellow lines here, this is the transportation by truck and these being close to the well pads you can basically send through pipelines. These are temporary pipelines. And then these are the tasks that we need to develop which is basically to perform the drilling of the various wells in each one of the, those paths. And how you assign 
the, uh, uh, the frag proof will then determine what is the schedule where you have to account also for the transfer time. Okay? So how do you predict the schedule? So this shows, and this was a collaboration with a small company in the Marcelo Shale Gas, uh, Carissa, where we had 14 well pads. We'd look at 400 and, uh, 540 days okay, with one frag crew. And here, this is a comparison of the schedule that was used by the company that we call the heuristic schedule. This is a schedule that was determined by the mixed integer linear programming model. Not surprisingly, the expected cost, this is expected cost because we do account for uncertainty on the availability of the creeks. There's uh, uncertainty involved there. But here you can see, again, a reduction from 15.7 million to 13.36. But the thing that is really uh, very striking here is a reduction in the trucking cost. You can see that actually the trucking cost in the MLP is being reduced by one order of magnitude, which means instead of having to perform 14,000 truck trips, we only require this, uh, uh, about 1,350 truck trips. And that means it's one order of magnitude reduction also translates into much fewer emissions of CO2 because of transportation. Now, why and how was this solution uh, developed? Well, here you can see we're showing the profile of the impoundment, the zigzag line, this is the historical data. The line in gray is basically the levels that were used by the company, They're basically trying to mimic the availability of the water. The one in yellow is the one from the optimal solution. And why is it the different profile? Because you see the top part here of the schedule, this shows basically each one of the well pads that is being drilled. This is in order A to G, then you have a gap here because there's no water available that you can withdraw, and then you continue the drilling here, although at a slower rate. Here in the MLP schedule, you can see there's a much wider gap here, and the order is being changed. And why is that? Because when you start having the shortage of water, basically what the optimization is doing is trying to accumulate some of that water to make it ready, available for the drilling at this stage. So an interesting thing that we found, for example, in this particular application was the fact that this was, first of all, a non-intuitive solution. And there is a lot of concern, for example, in the case of shale gas about the issue of track transportation because it does impact the communities, it does impact the roads, and also it impacts uh, through the uh, question of the emissions. So with this, let me just finish the uh, with last part on enterprise water optimization. So here, the idea is to really look uh, beyond the plant level and look basically even integration at business operations. So here, one of the uh, uh, good examples is in the petroleum industry, when you look at the supply chain, it's a very complex, long supply chain. You're starting at the level of the wellhead, you do trading, this is the heart of the manufacturing, refinery optimization. That's where traditionally the PSC has concentrated on. So we're now looking all the way back as we did before, the case of the uh, upstream operations, and then here you have trading and even delivery at the level of the pump. But it turns out this is not only for petroleum industry. So for example, if you look at the pharmaceutical industry and you look at the problem of drug development, so here you start with candidate targets and where you identify potential molecules that may be used for drugs. Then you go through this very arduous process of preclinical development, doing testing, then the various phases for the clinical trials, and then if hopefully one of those molecules, you know, is identified as being feasible for meeting the requirements of the drug, then you get the submission approval, and then you go into the marketing. The main point here, this is a very long process. It's often a very expensive process as well. And here again, we can use the principle, the concept that this is at the end nothing else but a supply chain different type of supply chain though. So the question in here is how to, what kind of problems can we address in this area? I would say one of the most um, prevalent uh, type of problems that has been addressed in this area is planning and scheduling. In particular, planning and scheduling of batch processes. This is actually a collaboration we had with Dow Chemical. We we're looking at the case where you had several batch units operating in parallel. One of the challenges here is that you have sequence dependent changeover. So how you sequence the production of the batches can have actually an impact on how efficiently you use these reactors and how you meet the requirements for the demands. Now it turns out this problem, if you try to formulate it as an MLP, it's huge. It can basically almost not be solved. So that's one of the lessons we also have learned here. You really need to tailor often special solution procedures. Like in this case, we're using bi-level decomposition where you have sort of a planning level 
that is detailed in the sense we account for changeovers through constraints that come from the traveling salesman problem. And then once we make the decisions on the assignments, then we do a lower level scheduling problem, slot-based MIOP model. And then uh, once we solve that problem, we get some bounds. And if the bounds are pretty much the same, we stop. Otherwise, we go back here and add some constraints. But again, it's the idea that often many of these problems are you know, unsolvable if you try to do them uh, just at once. And this is a particular example that we looked at over a period of uh, 12 weeks. So we're talking about three months. It's, uh, we have 10 customers, seven different products, and we have the case here of two reactors. And the schedule that was predicted uh, over 12 weeks, I'm only showing here the schedule for the first week. But you can see that one of the interesting things of these models, instead of, again, relying on spreadsheets or intuition, where somebody makes a decision, the model actually determines to produce 19 batches of E, and you have a changeover, you produce two batches of V, you go back to producing E, and then here you produce D, and this you do in the first reactor, whereas in the second reactor you do A, C, B, F, and, and so forth. Okay, so again, this is a level of detail, level of complexity, which is really quite difficult, of course, you know, to capture for humans. So what we're trying to do here is to provide also sort of uh, support decision tools for addressing these type of problems. And here, just the uh, question, that the bi-level decomposition actually converts in one single iteration. It took over you know, about 500 seconds to solve the, this problem. So computational time is an important one because if you're thinking of uh, providing this as an interactive tool, we cannot afford to have problems running you know, for many hours. A related problem to scheduling that's become sort of an emerging type of area is what is called these days demand, uh, demand side management. It's related also to the quote smart grid. And this is, uh, for example, especially significant in air separation plants, because in an air separation plant, what you have is raw material which is free. You don't pay for the air yet, okay, it's free. But what you do pay is electricity, electricity for doing the separations. Now the problem with the liberalization of markets and so forth, these prices you know, can change on a, almost on an hourly basis. And what you would like to do in this type of plant is to say, well, when the prices go up, I'd like to reduce my production. And, but when the prices go down, then I'm going to increase my production so that on average I can then reduce the cost due to electricity that is involved largely in the separation, in the cryogenic type of separation. And here, of course, we're producing multiple products, liquid oxygen, uh, gas oxygen, and so forth. And the uh, gas uh, components are, of course, sent through pipelines. The other ones are placed into storage units. So a problem that we addressed here again, in collaboration with Praxair, was to say, well, let's say we're given a plan and we're given information about how these prices may change over a period of time. What we'd like to determine is how should we modify the plan to give us more flexibility so that we can operate up and down in terms of capacity in order to pay, at the end, a lower electricity bill. And essentially, what we do then here is to determine production levels, levels of sales, inventories, and from a design point of view, what are the upgrades of equipment that you need? Do you need to buy new equipment? Maybe new storage tank. So that, that was basically a problem. So here again, you have kind of an interesting type of application, which has uh, not uh, been you know, uh, done very, uh, uh, at least until recently. And the big question here, because we want to look at the long-term horizon. This is a, a design problem. You're faced with a problem that, say, even if you look over one year period, you know, if you use a resolution on an hourly basis, your model is going to be almost unsolvable. So what we can do here is to say, well, we're going to represent for each season, you know, a profile of prices of electricity based maybe on some historical data. So in summer we have bigger swings. In the case of the spring, the swings are smaller. And essentially then here, what we're going to do is we consider then for each uh, uh, one of these seasons, if you wish, a representative week to avoid the hourly basis. So what we do here, we say, well, each week is represented by a representative week. And in that case, basically, we're reducing a season from 13 to only one single week. So it's basically reducing the time scale by a factor of 13. So instead of 8,700 hours, we're only working with 672 uh, time periods. And then here, well, if you look at the uh, equipment sizes, in this case, there are discrete sizes. I'm not going to describe the model, but just in words, 
you want to minimize both the operating costs for the electricity and the investment costs that you're going to make. You have constraints. And these are fairly complex constraints on operation because you cannot turn off and on the equipment uh, that easily or you cannot change the capacity also at will. So you have to meet certain physical constraints. And then you also have, of course, constraints related to the design alternatives. Now, so we applied this to this uh, particular problem where we looked at the possibility of upgrading a liquefier or buying a additional equipment. We also looked at the possibility of buying extra storage for the liquid products, liquid nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. And we look here at one year time horizon with two time decisions for the investment. And here you can see actually the size of the model is quite large. But here one of the reasons we're able to solve this problem in about half hour is because this model has what is called a tight relaxation. So in other words, some concepts of integer programming are being used to solve this problem actually quite effectively. And this is the answer that you get. Here in green is the profile of the price. As you can see, you go high here, you go low here. Now, the curve here in red is when you don't do any investment, you have very little room. So you can only decrease a little bit your production when the price goes up. Otherwise, when it goes down, you, you maintain the production almost at the same level. By buying the extra equipment okay, that we do here, Okay, this is the annualized cost. We're adding a new liquefier. We uh, buy an additional storage tank for the liquid nitrogen. In this case, you see if you do that, then you have the curve in blue where you have now much more flexibility of operation, even to a point that you can shut down the plant for this period of time because you have enough inventory in order to meet your constraints. So again, here is the question, the idea of doing scheduling and doing design, but in this case, actually accounting for pricing of electricity. And this is the last example I wanted to show because uh, this uh, has to do with the idea of looking at problems where you have not only one objective, but maybe two objectives. We're looking at response uh, supply chains, and the idea here is the following. So this was a problem that came from Nova Chemicals, and it was basically, again, here for producing polystyrene. And the question here, in green, you have potential locations of plants, like in Texas, in Louisiana, in Michigan, and you have suppliers in different parts, again, of the country, distribution centers in green, and finally, the triangles in red are your location of your customers where you need to provide the product. And the question here would be, what would be the optimal structure of the supply chain that manages you know, to produce polystyrene and is able to deliver that to your customers? So here again, this would be sort of the equivalent, if you wish, of a superstructure where we have different locations here with the different places, the different plants for producing the styrene, the location for distribution centers, and the customers. So in this case, the objective is actually twofold. It's economic. I want to maximize net present value, but I also want to provide good service to the customer, meaning good responsiveness. In other words, if a new order comes in, I don't want the customer to wait maybe for months until the new product arrives. We want to do that as quickly as possible. So how do we do this? Well, first, this arises because there's going to be uncertainty in the demand. So we assume in this case, like a, a normal distribution. And again, for here, we're making decisions on the structure of the network, on the operation, and on the schedules. Again, it's sort of a multi-level type of issue here. But one of the big, big, big issues is how do you model responsiveness? And again, without going into great details, let me just mention that for each one of the paths, basically, you can determine the expected lead time, basically working with the distribution function to see, on average, how much time it would take to provide the product all the way from the supplier to the customer. And this problem, actually, we are able to solve. It's a large-scale MINLP. But here we get the Pareto curves. This is the MPV versus the expected lead time. And here you can see the maximum MPV. It's up here, about 680, right? That would be the, the best economic performance. The best performance is in terms of lead time. It's 1.5 days here. We can respond as quickly on average as 1.5 days, but then my MPV goes down from 680 to something like 480. I take a very big hit. So with this curve, is these are the Pareto solutions, and of course the designer has to decide at the end. But here, since we have a relatively small decrease in the MPV, but we can reduce 
the lead time from five days to three and a half days, so it's you know, a very significant improvement in the performance, that would then lead, for example, to the supply chain I'm showing here. So again, it's a very different type of problem that maybe traditionally we have been working in process systems engineering, but it's definitely one that increasingly is being addressed by our community. In fact, this type of problem, uh, for example, when you think about supply chains, when you're worried about sustainability, where you want to include life cycle analysis, conceptually, it's a very similar concept in the sense you have objective here, the economic, in this case, you have economic environmental impact. And again, this can be performed by finding these so-called Pareto curves. There could be even special techniques like parametric programming. Okay? So again, I know I've covered maybe a lot of ground here, and this is maybe a good time to conclude and finish, but let me say a few words here. So I think the first main point I want to convey here is that I think post systems engineering is still very much an active, a vibrant area. I hope I convince you that there are some very important challenges, for example, in product and process design in the area of energy sustainability. And in relation to chemical engineering, that's very important because I think that's where we're very clearly, I think in my opinion, a lot of the needs you know, will be over the next, uh, uh, say, 10 years or so. The other one, enterprise web optimization, is the fact that now, again, we're expanding the scope of our problems. Now, however, it's very important to remember that while we look at these challenges, we should also remember that we do have some fundamentals in process systems engineering. Things like modeling, optimization, synthesis, operation, and control. So it's still very important to be able to develop some basic research on, for example, how to more effectively solve equations, how to more effectively perform process control, and so forth. Now, with this then, I think what we uh, really need to see as a challenge for the process system community to say, well, since we have all these ideas, and I think, for example, a good indication, as Professor Ghani told me, for next year, you receive more than 1,000 abstracts. So it's very clear there's a lot of work going on in the area. However, sometimes the connection with the uh, rest of our colleagues in chemical engineering is not always so transparent. So I think what we need is to better communicate the importance of this area, because it's definitely an area, and I think this is one of the keys. It's really driven largely by industry needs, and I think that's very important for engineering. We, if, we, if we ever reach a point where our discipline, chemical engineering, becomes divorced from industry, I'm sorry, I think then that's the end of chemical engineering, and I hope we will not see that to be the case. On the other hand, I think, uh, again, so th that's hopefully at the end a main message I want to convey here that I hope that the rest of the chemical engineering community also then recognizes the value of process systems engineering and maybe at the end we have to work uh, closer together in order to sort of bridge the gap uh, between the two communities, okay? So with this, I'd like to thank very much for your attention and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much.